Good afternoon. I want to begin um, reading Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 30. Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the sky. They don't sow seed or harvest grain or gather crops into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than they are? Who among you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Notice how the lilies in the field grow. They don't wear themselves out with work, and they don't spin cloth. But I say to you that even Solomon, in all of his splendor, wasn't dressed like one of these. If God dresses grass in the field so beautifully, even though it's alive today and tomorrow it's thrown into the furnace, won't God do much more for you, you people of weak faith? Who among you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? As I first explored this passage and began writing the sermon, that question really spoke to me. Who among you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? Maybe this question is stuck with me because personally, I really love to worry, or maybe because it makes a great point. However, I believe this question has been present in my thoughts because I see it as a challenge. Not to somehow prolong my life by worrying, which I could do. <laughs> However, a challenge to find what will add a single moment to life. If worrying will not sustain a long life, what will? I believe that Matthew warns against worrying not because people have nothing to worry about, but because the energy and time to vote devoted to worrying can be used in ways that change the world if they're simply redirected. I read this passage with ease. Don't worry about food or clothing the Lord will provide for you is an easy thought for someone who has a closet overflowing with clothing and a fridge full of food at home. Of course I will not worry. I have these things. And so do many who read this and sit in this room. We'll take this passage with a nod and a smile. But what about our brothers and sisters all around the world who are clothed and ripped in inadequate clothing? Our neighbors who cannot afford a pair of new shoes when there's break? Or the stranger you pass on the road who hasn't eaten in days and would never admit to such? How can you say to them, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body, what you'll wear? Such a statement would seem wrong and out of place. Informing them that the birds are fed without harvesting grain or sowing seed would be the opposite of a helpful statement. Quite frankly, it could come off as insulting. The birds aren't going to starve, neither are you, is not something I would want to hear if I was starving. Worrying can also be present in times when people are lacking more than just food and clothing. Many times, worry results from emotional distress and anxiety about situations which seem vastly unfair. My sophomore year of high school, my confirmation mentor and a very close friend was diagnosed with cancer. This news was devastating to me then and still stirs up sadness and anger as I reflect on it. Michelle was a social justice warrior, an activist, and a genuine friend to anyone she met. During the last few months of her life, I often worried about her health her life and her body. If I had read this passage then, I would have scoffed at the whole don't worry about your life thing. How could someone not worry about their life, which has overflowed with travel, culture, and service when they're approaching death? It's great that the lilies are beautiful in the fields, but what about Michelle? Why is God taking care of flowers and not this woman who has served him and others her whole life? I felt anxious when I would visit her and always awaited updates hoping for good news. I worried what would come. I worried she would die. This outstanding woman who had devoting her life to helping others make the most of what they had and showing them God's love was just human after all. Michelle had been and still is one of the most inspirational women in my life and I worried about losing her for my own selfish reasons as most of us do when someone we love is dying. However, one day it occurred to me that the anxiety and worry I felt when thinking about Michelle was overwhelming and not all that helpful. 
Worrying for her was not in any way going to extend her life or my own. The negativity, the bowling ball in the pit of my stomach was a burden which distracted me from what I really needed to do, and that was what she would do, help others, love others. Michelle was dearly beloved by our whole congregation, students, faculty, and staff at Berea College. There were a multitude of people hurting, and me feeling overwhelmed with anger and sadness and worrying was not productive or in any way helpful. It occurred to me that the best way to combat the worry I felt at the loss of Michelle was to do what she would do. Worrying would not prolong her life. Feeling upset and angry at God would not do anything either. The best way to keep Michelle alive was to replace moments spent worrying with moments spent helping others. Every time I wanted to lock myself in my room and feel angry, I asked myself if my actions were going to help elevate another human being. Now, I didn't run away and join the Peace Corps, and I still haven't figured out how to save the world. Not yet, anyway. But I did learn that doing something nice for someone who needs a little extra help or giving my time to a cause which serves the community feels a whole lot better than worrying. It's so easy to have faith in God when everything is going just fine. It is when life becomes bumpy that it is harder to trust God and spend time doing instead of time worrying. Matthew tells us not to worry about our lives, bodies, food, or clothing. He tells us that worrying will not add a single moment to our lives. So what do we do? If worrying and telling others not to worry will not add to the fullness of our lives here on earth, surely there must be something that will. How about when we want to tell someone to stop worrying about their next meal or a decent pair of shoes and how they'll get these things, we stop and ask how we can help that person. How can I assist this person in a way that alleviates their worries and allows them to focus on doing something good for someone else who's worrying? Matthew says, if God dresses grass in the field so beautifully, even though it's alive today and tomorrow it's thrown into the furnace, won't God do much more for you? He says that God will provide for and take care of all of us, telling us that we need not worry about our bodies, our clothing, or our food. God will provide for his creation, Matthew tells us, and sways us away from worrying. However, as his creation, it is our responsibility to God and to every other human being on this planet to take care of our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, and strangers. We will not prolong our lives by worrying about every event that is to come. That distracts us from the present. It distracts us from those around us who are in need of help, who are also burdened by worry. It distracts us from our calling to take action and to make change, to work to provide opportunities to minimize the number of people who are worrying about where their next meal or clothing will come from. Worrying is done way too well by way too many people. Think about all the days, all the months, and even the years people spend worrying. Imagine if the energy and the time put into worrying was used to solve one problem, or two, or four, or five. Consider the changes that could be made if any time we were worried, we reached out to our community and sought a supportive network of people who could help remedy a situation. When we worry, we lose sight of the part of ourselves that is here to make an impact. God loves everything in his creation, from the birds to the lilies, to even the most outcast and misunderstood of humans. He provides for and takes care of every species and organisms in his creation as a way to show his love. We are reminded by Matthew that God will take care of us and that we must not worry about our lives. Instead, we need to trust in the Lord. God calls us to spread his inclusive love in each moment that we spend worrying, maybe because we're distraught over situations beyond our control, or because we envy the person who seems to have it all together. We're missing out on a chance to say, I don't have it all together, but I can fix this. My church, my community, my God can fix this. It will be all right. As long as there's been life, there's been reason to worry. Whether worrying about food, water, shelter, or health, worry has been present among humans and is not going anywhere anytime soon. 
We cannot eliminate worry. All we can do is trust God along our journey and make it our mission to spend more time worrying about how we're going to fix problems, not just worrying because we have problems. God calls us away from worry and into a state of existence in which we devote our energy and time to making change instead of dwelling in challenging situations. As I was having my grandmother proofread this, she... Um, told me that my great-grandmother, this had been her favorite verses, and then my great-great-grandmother before her had a favorite poem that really, I feel, relates to this. So I'd like to end on that poem. It's written by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. It is easy enough to be pleasant when life flows along like a song, but the man worthwhile is the man who can smile when everything goes dead wrong. For the test of the heart is trouble, and it only comes with the years. And the smile that is worth the praise of earth is the smile that comes through the tears. Amen. Amen.